Thank you. Thank you. So next, uh, we we will come to our uh, key, key, key next session. Uh, uh, the next uh, uh, presenter uh, is the professor uh, Klaus. Hello. Yeah. 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 The professor Klaus Meyer from the Heidelberg University, Germany. Uh, professor. Uh, Professor, he is the managing director of the data science and the digital oncology at the German Cancer Research Center. Uh, professor, he is a full professor at the Heidelberg University and the managing director of the data science and the digital oncology at the German Cancer Research Center, GKSZ. He heads the division of medical imaging computing at the GKSZ and the pattern analysis and the learning group at the Heidelberg University Hospital. His research is focused on deep learning methodology uh, in the context of the medical imaging and the development of research software uh, infrastructure for efficient translation of results. Uh, let's, let's welcome for his talk entitled the Machine Learning in Medical Imaging, uh, Current Challenges. Thank you, Professor. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can all see my screen. Uh, yes, Professor, we can see your screen. All right. So thanks a lot for the kind introduction to let me speak today here. Um, and also, Leo, thank you for your, for your words. Um, preceding my talk. Um, so we are all working on, on race car engines, right? And um, I think you are perfectly right in stating that it's not all about the engine, even though we might be often torn uh, in between the worlds, right? Should I publish a new method uh, at NeurIPS or should I maybe uh, publish a paper in a medical journal? What about the novelty, the technical novelty? What about the application and um, I think the question that is all uh, in common uh, between us is the question how can I make maximum impact to the medical imaging uh, medical imaging community um, and uh, today in my talk I will be focusing on a couple of key elements that I consider really essential in order to make impact uh, to our community the medical imaging community So um, as a brief overview, I will be talking about the problems that we are working on. I will show you, for example, segmentations of brain tumors that look really good. And I will ask the question if we are solving the right problem here. I will also be talking about the data that we are working on. As Leo already mentioned, it's often the case that most of our data is actually not accessible to us in the research, and we are facing a lot of dark data, dark data in, in the health sector. Um, the fourth, uh, third part of my talk will be about generalization. So you all know the problem. You have read about a nice method, and you um, download the code, or you re-implement it, and you then realize that it's actually not working on your own data. And the fourth part of my talk will be about specialization. And uh, that's about basically adding stuff to the race car engine that Leo talked about. Okay, so let me come to the first part. Um, and that would be the problem. And we all know the dice similarity coefficient. Leo has also mentioned it. You might have 95% overlap or 90% overlap for your method. And um, the dice coefficient is basically the mo most widely used metric at the moment in uh, our international competitions that we are facing. Um, it has known pitfalls. <clears throat> I don't want to go through those pitfalls in too much detail. You might be aware of it already. So if you're looking at small structures, dice might not be optimal. Um, dice is also not looking at the shape. Uh, of things and dice is also not opti optimal if you are basically interested in um, 
in instances. And I will show you one example to actually make you really aware of this problem. So brain tumor segmentation is a task that our community has looked at for a long time now, I think more than a decade. So there's the Bretts competition happening every year at Mikai, and uh, we are comparing our methods. There are more than 200 teams competing. And as you can see here, uh, the current results, if you compare ground truth and prediction, they are looking really appealing and nice. And um, also, if you look at the voxel level um, metrics here, we have a recall of 0.94, which is quite high overlap and which um, is also reflecting uh, what you can see at, at those large scale competitions uh, that we are having as a community. So it looks quite good. However, if you now go to instance level, the same example here, you might realize that there's a small lesion. You can see it here on the slide on the bottom left corner. And this lesion has been missed by the segmentation method. And that means if you go to an instance level in your evaluation, you will get a recall of only 50% here, which is not quite good, I guess. So not really good. And um, I think what, what we really have to think about before we start solving problems, we have to think about solving the right problem. Um, so in case of brain tumor segmentation, um, we are often looking at a pixel level semantic segmentation, as you can see here on the bottom uh, of this figure. But we can also, of course, go to higher levels like object level, um, and we can go as far as to image level classification. And it really depends on the problem. So let's now talk a little bit about the brain tumor segmentation example that I gave. So here it might be optimal to look at segmentation, right? Because it's just close to what the clinicians want. But let's take a little bit of a closer look. So if you go to this voxel-based assessment, you can see here what happens if the number of instances of tumor instances in the image increases. And you can see, so first, maybe take a look at the red dotted lines. So this is a histogram of all the images that we looked at um, regarding the number of instances in the image. So you can see that many, that many patients have more than one tumor instance in the head. And then if you now look at the um, voxel-based assessment, you can see that no matter how many instances, the voxel level assessment is remaining quite stable. Um, but if you now go to the orange line, you look at an instance space assessment, you can see that the more instances we have, the lower the metric uh, drops um, if you um, evaluate the score at instance level. So that shows you that for tasks with multiple instances, um, our current voxel-based metrics actually very much overestimate the instance performance. And we can also see here that if you have uh, on, on the two axes here, uh, voxel-based and instance-based measures, you can see that there's not much of a correlation. Um, the relationship between voxel and instance-based scores is really weak if you compare them. So for me, this poses the question um, whether we are actually solving the right problem. Huh? So is this relevant? I mean, we are basically not seeing the decline of quality when we have more than one instance using the dice score. And um, in the typical challenges that we have at the moment, we are only looking at dice score. So what does this actually, what, what kind of impact does this have? And now let's look, let's look at the clinical, um, at the clinical impact of, of, of these methods. So in this first line here of the table, I'm showing volume progress. So volume is one thing that we are really interested in during, um, uh, during the clinical workflow. So we want to basically compare tumor volumes and whether tumor volumes progress over time. And here you can see 502 cases where the tumor volume has been uh, noted as a progress by clinical experts. And uh, we can see that we can basically detect using our automatic segmentation technique, 87% of these cases. But now let's go a little bit 
further and let's look at instance progress. And this has also important clinical impact, right? So if the instance progress uh, happens, that means that we have more instances in one time point than in the time point previously, uh, then this can have impact on the clinical uh, basically procedures. And we have 714 cases here where we have such an instance progress happening and our method, the automatic segmentation technique can only detect 63 of these cases. Let's go even one step further. And this, this is really uh, of high clinical importance. This case is showing menu, uh, cases where the experts have detected a progress from one to many instances. And now you can see that our current segmentation methods are only able to detect 49% of these cases. So it's less than half of these cases. And we are missing these by our automatic detection methods that still they pose nine dice scores of 95% or so, but they are not able to detect 49% of these clinically essential cases. <clears throat> And this progression, according to the clinical criteria, is missed. So I'm learning from this um, that sometimes going, taking a step back and thinking about the clinical need and the clinical actual problem can help us to broaden our view on problems. I mean, segmentation is relevant. No, no question. We have to also compare volumes and we have to detect volume progression but we also have to detect instance progression. So this is just a, a thing that we have missed, I think, as a community so far. And in order to basically circumvent such cases where we are only looking at one metric as a community and where we are missing things, um, we have an initiative at the moment. And actually my wife, Lena Meyer, is leading, is leading that initiative. It's a Delphi process. And it's an initiative that's trying to systematically derive um, the right metrics uh, following the driving biomedical problem. So we are going here from the driving biomedical problem to the right metric. And basically this paper that you can also see here cited is addressing very different things. So inappropriate phrasing of the problem, for example, as I've shown you, object detection confused with semantic segmentation, but also pure metric selection. So once you have uh, appropriately phrased your problem, you still need to find the correct metric that reflects your problem. And then also the app, the basically the application of your metric has to be done correctly. And this is also addressed in this peep in this um, paper here. It's a large consortium uh, and, and it's a Delphi process. So it's a consensus that's tried to be reached here between all these partners. Uh, um, so we are fingerprinting the problems. We are deriving structured representations of our problems, and we are then providing a framework uh, to actually come uh, that, that is applicable to common biomedical use cases to actually come then to the right metric uh, that you need uh, to apply. So I really recommend this as a read. Okay, so I've now talked about the problems we are trying to solve as a community. And I think this requires super tight interaction with the clinicians and also deep technical understanding. And then of course, once you have your problem defined and Leo also mentioned that you need data, right? And often the majority of data is not available for us to perform our AI workflow. And um, there are many obst obstacles and uh, we are heavily working on basically um, lowering these barriers, making data available, but also very importantly, we are working on the problem of federating our analysis. So instead of sending data around, we are looking at sending algorithms around that work, that basically learn then uh, while being sent, while being traveling around from clinic to clinic. We are building an infrastructure uh, to be able to do that, which is called Kapana. So you might want to take a look at that. It's based on various open source technologies, uh, Kubernetes, container technologies, microservices. And um, it's our basically operating system that we implement in each of the partners in the federation. And um, based on these concepts, we can then do things like, for example, organize federated challenges. So we had at this, yes, Mikai, um, 
again, the FETS challenge, which is a federated tumor segmentation challenge. So instead of um, collecting all the data and testing algorithms on pooled data, we are sending around the algorithms to more than 30 collaborating institutions and more than 2,500 test cases. And we are testing these algorithms basically in many, many places around the world on many, many different data sets from, for example, different uh, scanners from in different continents. And um, we can show then systematically that data sets or that actually it matters quite a bit um, on what data set you basically perform your analysis, on what clinic you perform your analysis. There are huge gaps between different clinics and algorithms tend to fail uh, on some of these uh, data sets because there's some kind of a domain shift in there. Um, we are also working in several other projects where we are using such federated setups. Um, one example here is Raccoon, which you can see on the top left. And I think in the future, we will increasingly look um, at federated setups because we are just in the need of large scale data. And I think in, in an optimal case in the future, we will basically work on almost all data that we have uh, in the world. And, and Raccoon is, is one step uh, in that direction, basically uniting all 36 university clinics in Germany to, to allow, joint, allow joint analysis on, on COVID-19 data sets. And uh, yeah, I think one important thing to consider is that such federated scenarios are also quite work intensive. So you need to do the politics, you need to do, uh, you need to have basically people in, in the institutions at the moment to talk to. It's not a completely automated thing uh, that can just be done without any efforts. And I think the more we, we are going into that direction, the less the effort will be. And I think in the future, it will get easier and easier, hopefully. Um, to basically make, make this uh, suitable and possible for many different uh, use cases. So in case you're interested, please check our Kapana uh, software that you can find uh, here at various different uh, sites if you're interested. So I've been talking about the data problem. Mm -hmm. So this requires politics, as I said, this requires a network of clinical partners. It also requires critical mass of people because you have, uh, besides the algorithm design, you also have some system engineering problems. And I mentioned it very briefly, algorithms do not work in some of the institutions. And I think this is one central problem for the community to develop things and algorithms that actually generalize. So my next part of the talk will be about generalization. And here I will be focusing on one specific expert of uh, one specific um, part of generalization. And that is basically how do I adapt my method if I have a new data set that I want to apply it to. And um, so the current workflow is as follows. You have your method, you have your data set, and then you basically start configuring your hyperparameters and you go through this loop of training and evaluating your method and then you have to take some decision, okay, is it good enough? Or do I go back to the hyperparameters to tune them even further? And this can be quite frustrating, I guess, because it's not clear at the moment, and Leo also mentioned that, <clears throat> where you wanna go, what's your optimum performance that you can get? And, and, and it's also, there's nobody who can tell you how to optimally tune your parameters in order to get better. So it requires a lot of expert knowledge and also trial and error. It's really time consuming. It takes hardware resources. And I think importantly at the moment we have in many, many fields, we have a missing standardization that actually hamper, hampers our research progress. So I think we need to start as a community to start thinking about this process in a much more strategic and standardized way. And um, our contribution into that direction is the NN unit. Many of you might know it already. It basically starts making rules and making sense out of this process of configuring methods um, for deep learning based biomedical image segmentation in that case to be applied to different data sets. 
We have shown in, in the paper in, in 2020 that it works for many, many different data sets. Uh, we have also shown that by systemizing this approach, we can learn basically so much because you broaden your view, right? You, so you, you stop looking at only one problem, but you look at very different problems at the same time. And I think this is really nice for learning what actually works and what actually does not work in a generalized setting. And uh, so we have shown that we can actually win a lot of challenges by looking at many, many different problems and then trying to learn from these different problems and take the take home messages basically to also get better on your specialized problem. So, and then unit wins challenges and it's still winning challenges, even though it's not made specifically for that challenge, right? It, it's, it's a generalizing method. Um, so in 2020, nine out of 10 uh, segmentation challenge winners based their method on NN unit. And in 2021, uh, the, the picture was quite similar for segmentation challenges. And still this year at Mikai, um, segmentation challenges are being won by NN unit. Uh, so everybody has NN unit, so you will not win it, the challenge if you only apply NN unit, but it's basically now being used as a framework to implement new methods on basis of the original NN unit um, that are then uh, winning challenges. So it's a good starting point for you in order to develop novel ideas on basis of this framework. I have talked about solving the right problem. And uh, an unit, again, is basically only for semantic segmentation, right? So the bottom layer here in this figure. Um, but I think this principle would apply to many, many different areas. And um, one further example that we are currently also working on is NN detection. So this is a very similar framework, um, but built for the idea of detecting objects in images. Um, we are currently receiving very nice results uh, on various data pools. Um, one problem in detection is there's not so many detection challenges uh, that you could use in order to compare your method. And also, um, there's, of course, no baseline method that can be applied to all these detection uh, problems at the same time. So we need to make our own baseline. We, we are using at the moment an unit as a baseline by post-processing basically the pixel-wise classifications and making a detection method out of it. And uh, on top of that, we are building then an detection, which is performing quite nicely. It's also winning challenges. Already, as you can see here for the Luna 16 data set, it has really nice uh, results, um, only beaten by one method that uses false positive reduction um, as an additional step, which is out of scope here for us. But um, so I think this is quite promising, and I think it's a direction in the future that we should continue to be taking. Um, so yeah, that was my uh, part generalization and. Um, I think it's, it's basically the grand challenge of for the community. There are many different uh, ways of approaching generalization, and you might know also many of these uh, ways, transfer learning, self-training, unsupervised learning, out of distribution modeling. So many, many different interesting areas that we can tackle in order to, to get better in the generalization of our methods. Um, and so my last part here of my talk will be then about specialization. And so maybe as a, as a little comment before I, I start on that, I think way too often as a community, we are using, um, we are building some method, we are, we are extending, specializing some method, uh, just instead of using a strong baseline. I think, I think this is happening way too, way too often. I think we should really spend some thought of whether we should specialize or extend a method in order to, to solve the problem at hand. And um, I, I want to present to you one case where we as a community should be considering specialization and should, should be considering extending the current set of methods because it's really missing at the moment, but required. And this is the processing of data that is basically acquired at many different time points. So here in green, you can see examples of data sets that we can nicely handle using our current toolbox of deep learning, right? And um, so it's 3D data, 4D data, 
3D plus T data. But basically what we are always looking at, patients are going to the doctors more than one time. So we have several different acquisitions here um, that are irregularly sampled on the time axis, but quite sparse. So eight data sets, for example, 10, 10, 10 visits at the doctor at uh, arbitrary time points on the time axis. And we are at the moment, even though most of our data looks like it, looks like that we don't have any methods to actually um, adequately handle such data sets. So let me show you one first attempt of ours to actually go into that direction. So if you want to uh, learn from such sparse and irregular time series, you could use methods such as Gaussian processes. They are really nice for scalar time series, but they are not um, applicable to images, to higher order uh, data sets like images. Um, so neural processes are capable of doing so. They can, in principle, handle uh, higher order data sets, um, higher dimensional data sets like uh, images. They are not made for images, but we are, and here in our idea, um, merging the idea of neural processes with the unit architecture in order to be able to process images. It's also if they are, um, are given as a sparse and irregular time series. So here you can see on the top right, a data set that I'm talking about. So we have, um, it could be a brain, but could be anything. So here we have some brain tumor images and these brain tumor images are acquired at different time points. On the time axis, we have in this case, 400 patients um, with um, I think five to 11 time points per patient. And now the classical, way of actually modeling such a progression over time in brain tumor images would be to build a, a biological model of tumor progression, like the using the reaction diffusion equation. And this has also been done in the past. But here now our goal is to, uh, to learn this process, to learn it from the data itself and to model it as a, as a probabilistic pro uh, problem and actually being able to predict the future, but also to interpolate between time points uh, using a deep learning method. So here you can see an overview of, of the architecture that we are proposing. And it's basically um, a neural process, as you can see here in the bottom uh, of, of the U, but it's um, uh, also, uh, it comprises some attention modules that are inserted here in the middle, spatial temporal uh, attention and also a temporal attention. And we have some initial results that we also present, presented at Mikai, and we are continuously building upon these that show that we can actually use such methods to model uh, such processes that go over time. Uh, so you can here see that we, we have nice results on toy data sets uh, that actually predict the reference on the left side. Of course, we have also failure cases uh, where the time information, which is, as I said, irregularly sampled and also sparse. So we only have a couple of snapshots to learn from. Uh, in some cases, it's not enough to actually predict the correct reference. Um, and we are also using this, for example, to model uh, tumor growth here. And we have some really promising results. You can see the reference on the left side where the actual patient evolvement over time is shown. And then you can see um, the mean prediction of uh, our method, and you can also see different samples that we took from that mean prediction. Um, and it shows you that it's actually, the method is actually producing results that look realistic. Um, also the quantitative ev evaluation uh, shows that um, only, I think that that's also important. Uh, the method does not know anything about tumor growth, right? It, it learns tumor growth from data. So it can be used in principle for any stochastic time series um, that we are entering here that, that we could be faced in, in the medical imaging um, regime. So I was, I'm not sure about the time, but I think I, I had 30 minutes. We were a little bit late. This is my last slide. Um, I have talked about four different um, four, four different um, 
elements that I consider important in order for us to make a true impact to the medical image community. Um, I think we should be really think about the problem that we are trying to solve. We That requires, as I said, super tight interaction with clinicians. It also requires, of course, a deep technical understanding. Um, I think we should really invest in our data um, and easily be the majority of work right to get to get the data right um, also requires in, in federated setups it requires politics it requires a technical infrastructure so it can be quite a lot of work and then i've talked about generalization and specialization um, and also here i think generalization is our our main goal as a community to to achieve methods that actually generalize and and, and tackle the complete heterogeneity of data that we are facing um, and we should really think closely before we start specializing things. And I've given you one example of where we should actually do that um, to move forward in, in, in the medical imaging uh, world. So with that, I'm already at the end of my talk. Uh, here are some of our funding agencies and collaborators. And this is the team that has done the work. And I will thank you about, my, about uh, listening and inviting me here. Uh, to giving this keynote. Thank you. Uh, James, Professor, can you hear my voice? Hello? Hello, Professor Kloss. Yes, can yes, I can hear you, yes. Thank you. So today, like uh, in the uh, uh, on-site room, uh, I think uh, 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 almost uh, like everyone is seated. We have we have even the chairs. We, we, we just borrow, I think, uh, uh, about five or six chairs from the neighboring room. Uh, uh, I think this will attribute to your uh, excellent uh, report because uh, this report uh, can help us, like in our future research. And uh, uh, and also we found there are some uh, some other attendees from uh, uh, from other neighboring uh, meetings. They also join uh, our room. And uh, now uh, I uh, uh, I will give the microphone to our office. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to ask. So William, do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, and one of our, uh, our attendees says this is an excellent presentation. So may, may I ask you a question, uh, Professor? When I uh, when I listened to your PowerPoint slides, I uh, I I particularly I noticed that you have, you have uh, uh, introduced the uh, glioma growth model. So can you please uh, uh, introduce more on that model? Yes. So um, we, we are interested in glioma growth uh, for some for some years now, and um, so what what we have tried and many many others have also tried that uh, in the beginning is we, we have tried to be modeling this on a biological basis so how does we have thought about how does the growth work biologically and how can we put this into equations and one one uh, equation is the diffusion reaction equation right that has been used a lot in order to uh, to do such modeling um, so the diffusion, the diffusion, the um, diffusion reaction, uh, reaction diffusion equation is, is basically the one way of modeling modeling this uh, biological process manually. However, it's it's of course not able to capture the whole complexity of tumor growth, right? And um, it's and 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 also um, it's very hard for an expert to to basically um, configure. All the parameters in such a biological model in order to optimally um, uh, and adequately model tumor growth, which is highly complex. So I think that we can as, so so I, I, I thought we, we were not not going any further with this uh, manual modeling and I thought we need we need something that is actually learning the process from data and uh, that's the, ma the main idea I think we need to develop models that are actually capable of learning from true patient progress and from from large data sets where we can basically 
look at tumor progress. And, and, and this is the idea here. So we, we have uh, come up here with a method that is actually um, getting those tumor progression uh, from patients, actually taking this as training data and then trying to learn the biological process directly from data. And, um, and, and we have shown that this is actually quite efficient and that this can be done. And I think now in the future, um, we can now start on trying to combine the learning-based modeling also with the biological modeling and using mechanistical models to basically inform our deep learning or to, to interact with our deep learning. And we are actually working on this at the moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Professor. Can I have a one question? Okay. Yes, please. This is a microphone. Oh, yeah, Professor, thank you for your uh, uh, nice speech and uh, presentation. Uh, just a question. Uh, after a while, of course, I expected that uh, we will see each other here uh, uh, physically so that we will have a time to discuss this matter. It is very hard to express this uh, through the one question. But uh, coming from a different field and trying to do my impact to all these uh, strategies in uh, medical imaging, so coming from the process technology and information technology uh, through the years and following the technology growth through the years, I can now find out that we are here uh, just discussing the things that in, uh, let's say, technology uh, on the other side, if you see the uh, industrial technology, and what we did in industrial technology, it is just uh, simply comparable. So, uh, of course, uh, I'm coming from this uh, uh, identification of uh, dynamical systems. And uh, uh, if we want to see that mathematically, everything what we see here on your presentation and ideas are, uh, let's say, clearly already discussed and developed on the other side. So what I'm uh, suggesting here, just as in my impact to hold this system, you know, uh, and you mentioned yourself uh, with the generalization and uh, uh, let's take it as a standardization. Uh, our view should be done on the way that we have to contribute to the general language in between us. And that language, uh, I just take as an example, most probably you most likely, let's say you use MATLAB or some other, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, libraries or some other platforms to develop your uh, models. But if, if you see the development of MATLAB itself, and uh, I'm, uh, let's say, start, I started in my studies uh, uh, with the little scratches of MATLAB and the Simulink. So we develop uh, blocks and blocks are related to our dynamical system and cyber physical world. The same way we have to do in a medical uh, uh, surroundings. So we have to start to do the mathematical definition and modeling our uh, 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 biomedical world. So this kind of things, uh, uh, maybe it is clear for us, but uh, looks like in this uh, uh, area, in medical area, it's not uh, quite clear. Yesterday, I also followed, I hope you followed yourself also these uh, meetings uh, and uh, online uh, talks. Uh, some, uh, let's say some professor from Utah or California already addressed these troubles uh, and, and uh, uh, of course, from our electrical and information engineering society. So we have to try to standardize the data first, of course. Uh, also on your slides, uh, we see the data, uh, uh, which is important and the slides from uh, keynote speech, uh, the data, uh, uh, importance of the data. But it is not only importance of the data, we have to also to uh, define what are we having with the neural network. So we are not having anything special. This is not a miracle. So this miracle works for a while in industrial technology and this miracle now have to be framed in the medical surroundings. So I would like to see, uh, of course, you most probably have your uh, opinion about this, what I'm saying. Uh, can you please express that? Yeah, thanks a lot for your viewpoint from, from a different domain. Um, I. I I completely agree and uh, with you with respect to um, other domains. I, I'm sure other domains have the same issues to, to a certain point. And also I'm sure that many, many domains might have solved these questions um, uh, uh, partly or, or fully uh, um, for their domain. But I'm so 
I'm a little bit hesitant uh, here to fully to fully support your statement in that sense, as it it sounds a little bit like we only need the right tools, and then we can solve our problems. I think what we actually and that that's what I also try to transport a little bit today. I think what 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 we need to achieve here in the medical imaging community is basically the way of think the way of thinking, right? So the way of thinking, what what is actually the added value that we as specialists in medical image community can bring into the game? And I think the way of thinking should be the very close interaction with the clinicians, because I mean, the best technical toolbox does not help if you're solving not the exact right problem, right? So I think we, we need a way of thinking interaction with clinicians. We need to invest a lot in our data and that's not only standardization, but it's also um, basically investing in networks and investing in uh, technology to basically make accessible clinical data um, uh, uh, for research. And it's also investing in te technologies like container technology and uh, and private cloud technology. And I mean, these tools are there, but it's, it's basically a way of thinking the community should adapt in the future. And, um, and, and so that, that's a little bit of my of my point. And I'm sure we can learn a whole lot from other communities that are, of course, actually uh, uh, facing very similar challenges, right? But um, so the question is, what can we do as experts in medical imaging? And I think our expertise is very much needed uh, in, in order to get this uh, to work in, in our community of, of the medical imaging community. And so I think this interaction, I mean, I would be really, really um, obliged to talk to you about how you solve um, the problems in, in a different community. I think we can learn a lot and then we can, we need to make sure how, how, how to adapt this way of thinking in the medical imaging uh, community. Uh, okay, thanks, Professor. And uh, sorry, due to the time ha has already passed, so uh, we we can't uh, accept uh, no more questions. And uh, if you have any questions to Professor, feel free to drop an email uh, to uh, to uh, Professor uh, Klaus. Klaus, thanks again for your excellent uh, talk. Thank you. Thanks, and, 